don't know about you, if you enjoy your home. I, I like my home. I, I like sitting on the front porch reading. I like going inside into uh, a room that has a window unit when it's 90 degrees outside. That was I was always told Colorado was cool in the summer. But it's almost 100 degrees some days here, but we have air conditioning. I walk inside and stand in front of the air conditioner and I'm cool again. I enjoy central heat in the winter. I really enjoy that um, when it's single digits outside. I enjoy, I have this, this mechanism on my door that turns uh, and locks the door and uh, deadbolts the door shut. I enjoy having that, having the safety of my home. You know, we're headed out to Uncapagre Wilderness today. Some of us are spending the night there, but out in the wilderness, there are no front porches. There's no air conditioning, for sure. And I've been there when it's been pretty cold. There's no heat there, unless you bring something. There are no doors to lock. And then there are even more things out in the wilderness that are not in your home, like bears <laughs> and mountain lions. No. So, when some people think of the wilderness, they focus on those things, the negatives, the, the lack of comfort, the, the lack of safety, the reign of the wild animals. And for some, these aspects of the wilderness make them fearful and anxious. What, what if I run out of food? What, what if we run out of water? What if I have to use the restroom? What if a bear comes and invades my camp? These are real scenarios here in, in Colorado in the wilderness. But many of you have been to Uncapagre. Uh, I asked how many of you have been to the West Fork, and a lot of you raised your hands last week. Why do you go? Why do you go up there? Maybe it's because in the midst of the uncertainty, the danger, and the limited resources, you find the wilderness to be life-giving and uplifting. The difference may be perspective. Uh, maybe it's the possession of bear spray that is the difference between fear and uh, comfort. But maybe you go to the wilderness in peace because you believe that God led you there. Or you have a peace that he's with you there. As opposed to those that might go without acknowledging who God is or not even knowing who God is. That the wilderness might be even a more scary place. Well, in today's passage, there's one word that kind of unifies the whole passage. It's repeated multiple times. And that word is wilderness. Wilderness. Turn with me to Mark 1. We're going to start in verse 2. Last week I gave an overview of Mark, so if you weren't here last week, you can check it out on our website. I spent about 30, 40 minutes talking about the background of who Mark was, what was going on, when we think the, the Mark was written. So we're going to start in verse 2 today. We're going to read about John the Baptist, the beginning of Jesus' ministry, as well as a period of testing that came for Jesus. And all of these things occurred where? wilderness. They all occurred in the wilderness. All three of these things. So, if you'll stand with me, if you're able, as we read Mark 1, 2 through 13, in honor of God's word. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. The voice of the one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, <clears throat> wore a leather belt around his waist, ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open 
the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. The Spirit immediately drove him into the wilderness, out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness forty days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, last, last week I mentioned that this is written by Mark, also called John, or sometimes called John Mark. He was with Peter the early days. In fact, there were prayer meetings from the early church in Jerusalem at his house. He was there when Peter was released from prison miraculously. He heard the stories, saw them. He was experiencing them firsthand. He is the cousin of Barnabas. And Barnabas and Paul took him on mission trips, so he traveled all over with Paul. Then later in his life, he was with Peter in Rome while Peter was killed. And we don't know whether he wrote Mark right before Peter's death or right after or during. <clears throat> but we think it was about 65 AD that he wrote the Gospel of Mark. Most likely the first Gospel that was written. Written to the Romans. The Romans were people of action. They liked it <coughs> full of fury. And so he writes a lot of action and not that much in terms of teaching and explanation. So when Mark writes, you hear the word, we read it, one of them already th this morning, immediately. He says, and immediately, and immediately. If you're reading Mark, boom, it goes to the next thing. It's full of action. And uh, as we noted last week, this, he writes, is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And that, in fact, is Mark's main goal, is that we who would read this would see that Jesus is the Son of God. That is climax we'll see in chapter 15. But in Mark fashion, right here, after giving some Old Testament prophecy, he jumps right into verse 3, or verse 4. He says, John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness. He doesn't go back and give us a lot of background on John. We don't hear the story of Zacharias. We get those in other Gospels. How his parents had this miraculous child that God told them would be called John, who would be a forerunner of the Messiah. But he just jumps right in. Look back at verse 2 with me. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now, John appeared in the wilderness. The first point under that, he appeared in the wilderness in fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. Now, in these sentences, in these verses right here, we have a mixture of two verses, maybe even three verses that are put together. And I think he uses the word Isaiah, he said, just as is written Isaiah, because that was the most famous, the most common of the um, Old Testament verses that he's quoting here. But he, he puts together uh, a couple different verses. The first is from Malachi 3.1. You can just jot that down. Malachi 3.1. The Italian prophet Malachi. We also call him Malachi. He said, uh, it's the last book of the Old Testament. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. That's in Malachi 3.1. That is kind of blended together with Exodus 23, 20. That's when Jesus, or when God, was sending the Israelites out, and he's saying, I'm taking you out of Egypt, but I'm going to send my angel before you. And he says in Exodus 23, 20, Behold, I send an angel before you to guard you on the way, to bring you to the place I have prepared. The third is Isaiah 43. Isaiah 40. Verse 3, a voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. An Isaiah passage was the most well known of it. It mentions the wilderness motif here that Mark is using, talking about. God is working out his plan. He's making good on his promises that he, that he gave us in Isaiah and he gave his people, the Jews, the Israelites in Isaiah 
and in Malachi, that he would send someone before the Messiah, that this someone would, would appear as a voice in the wilderness, that he would prepare people, and he would be one crying out, preparing the way before the Lord. Well, this is changed in Mark. It says, I will prepare, who will prepare your way? Now he's talking about Jesus. We'll prepare your way. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. John appeared in the wilderness. Why? Uh, well, partly because that's where he was prophesied to be. That's what God said in Isaiah and Malachi, that especially in Isaiah 40, that it would be in the wilderness that the voice would cry out. He would start there in the wilderness. And in this wilderness would be this man who would be a messenger, who would prepare the way of the Lord. Now, who, who is this? Let, let me read this description. I want you to think, who is this? He wore a garment of hair with a belt of leather about his waist. Who is he talking about? John the Baptist? No, it's not. Elijah. That verse is about Elijah. 2 Kings 1.8. Of course I set you up, right? 2 Kings 1.8 says this. He wore, they answered him, he wore a garment of hair with a belt of leather about his waist. And he said, it is Elijah the Tishabite. And the point is this. John appeared in the wilderness to fulfill Old Testament prophecy. He also appeared in the spirit of Elijah. And what I mean by that is we're to see a connection between John the Baptist and Elijah and the role that Elijah played as being a prophet, as being one who would prepare Israel to receive God's word as one of the most powerful prophets of all time. John the Baptist comes on in the same way. Look with me at verse 6. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. Now if you read that and you knew your Bible and you knew 2 Kings 1.8, he wore a garment of hair and a belt of leather about his waist, you would see, you would catch this connection between Elijah and John the Baptist. And when these men saw John the Baptist in the wilderness crying out, and they see this man wearing camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, they're thinking, wait a minute, I, I, I heard about this guy, Elijah dressed just like that, this is rem reminding me of him. Well, Malachi 4, 5, a little bit after that passage that talked about a voice in the wilderness, that was in uh, Isaiah, but the... Um, Malachi 3 1 said, Behold, I send my messenger, he will prepare my way. Malachi 4 5, Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. So God, God prophesied that Elijah would come again before Jesus. Now, this I don't believe this is Elijah reincarnated. I don't believe that. I don't believe this is Elijah appearing again. I believe John the Baptist appeared in the likeness and in the spirit and in the power of Elijah. And in hearkening back to what God said, that he would send Elijah beforehand. Now, Jesus says this too. In Mark 9, 11, Mark 9, 13, Jesus says, I tell you, Elijah has come. Because they're saying, wait a minute, I thought before he, the Messiah came, Elijah would come. And he says, Elijah has come. And they did to him whatever they pleased, as it was written of him. In Matthew eleven twelve. Jesus said this, From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you're willing to accept it, he is Elijah, who is to come. He who has ears, let him hear. So Jesus himself is making this connection, that John the Baptist is this Elijah that was supposed to come as a forerunner, as a person to prepare the way of the Lord. So John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness to fulfill scripture. He appeared in the spirit of Elijah, but why did he come? Why is he here? Look back in Mark 1, 4. John appeared baptizing in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. 
And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were coming out to him, were being baptized him by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. John appeared in the wilderness to fulfill scripture in the spirit of Elijah to prepare the way for Jesus. To prepare people to receive Jesus. He prepared people to hear Jesus' message. And the main way that he did that is he urged them towards repentance. He urged them towards repentance. The focus was on repentance. He urged the Jews to repent, to confess their sin. Remember, God had judged Israel. That's the northern tribes, the northern ten tribes. What country took, took Israel away? Assyria. Assyria took the northern ten tribes away, right? Then Judah, who took the Judah, Judah, the Babylonians, then took the bottom two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, took them into exile. But God judged. He used Assyria to judge Israel for their sin. He used the Babylonians to judge Jerusalem and Judah and, and um, tribe of Benjamin for their sins. And they were taken out. Then they returned, remember? They came back. The exiles they got to return. They first built the temple. Then they built a wall. Nehemiah built a wall around Jerusalem. And then they were back in the land. But then the, the Babylonians fell to the Persians. The per Persians fell to the Greeks. The Greeks fell to the Romans. And in Jesus' time, Jerusalem was still not free. It was occupied by Rome. And the Romans were now the judgment of God upon his people. And John the Baptist is telling the Jews, repent. Repent of your sin. Turn from your sin. Turn to God. Confess your sins. And they did that. And then John baptized them. Now it's interesting. This passage was written in 65 AD. Think about where we are in time. Mark's writing this about 65 AD. Jesus ascended into heaven mid-30s, 33, 34. It's, it's been 20 plus years, 30 years really, since Jesus ascended and people were being baptized as Christians. If they believed in Jesus, he told the, his disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So this has been going on for 30 years, and when Mark writes this, he doesn't have to explain what baptism is about. He doesn't have to explain Christian baptism. And he's writing to the Romans, and they're probably aware of this rite of baptism and understanding what's going on. He just says it. He says, John baptized them. He doesn't go into great detail. But, you know, it appears that John the Baptist was calling the Jews into the same practice that Jesus told his disciples to perform on people that come to him. He, he asked them to be baptized. But this baptism was an outward symbol. And it signified their faith and their repentance in the same way that Gentile Christians would observe and had to observe. Not much more can be concluded by this passage. We, we don't know too much about this. But John's baptizing Jews... And it says it's a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. Most commentators focus in on the repentance piece as the forgiveness of sin. As opposed to saying that this baptism, them being baptized, made them forget, forgiven of their sin. It was their repentance before the Lord. It was their faith in the Messiah who was to come. That's what saved them. That's what gave them forgiveness. And it's the same thing for us, right? It's our repentance, our sin, confessing our sin before the Lord, repenting and coming before Him that saves us. And we, we uh, believe in baptism in this church. That it's an outward symbol of our faith, of our repentance that we have before the Lord. But... Not too much can be concluded. It does appear it was in the Jordan River. It says Jesus came up out of the water. It does appear he went into the Jordan River and was baptized. Some of the paintings of this, uh, which obviously are not scripture, have him pouring water over Jesus' head. Some show him baptizing Jesus and Jesus coming up out of the water after he was baptized. There, there's, a, there's some unknown here. 
But what we can say is that John appeared before the Jews and he told them, repent, confess your sin, get right before the Lord because judgment is coming. And the Lord, the day of the Lord is coming. He's coming. He prepared their hearts. And he said they were forgiven because of their repentance, confessing sin. And his baptism was a baptism of repentance. We've all seen car scenes, right, in, in, in movies. I don't know what your favorite movie with car scene is. You've got to have a good car scene. You know, car chase, you know, if it's a car movie, you've got to have a good car chase. You know, somebody's chasing you, they're going, and they, I, have no, I don't, don't know how to do this, so I'm speaking a little bit out of ignorance. But uh, you're flying, you, you pull the parking brake, you tap on the brakes, you cut the wheel, and all of a sudden, you do a perfect 180, and boom. You're flying back the other way. And the people that are chasing you can't do that on time and you get away, right? That is repentance. You're going headstrong away from God. And all of a sudden, you hit the brakes. You do a 180. You flip that car around and you are headed back to him. That's what John is asking the Jews to do. Turn their cars around, Jews. Yes, or your chariots, as it were. Look with me in verse 7 and 8. So we have John came to fulfill Scripture. He appeared in the wilderness to fulfill Scripture in the spirit of Elijah. Why? To present Jesus, to prepare people to hear God's word through repentance. And he also announced the Lord's coming. Verse 7. He preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. John is the herald of Jesus. How many of you saw Knight's Tale? I thought like it's only a few years. It's been 21 years since that movie came out. 2001. 21 years. Heath Ledger is a, is a pauper, right? He was born in Cheapside. But he has incredible skill because he was a squire to one of the knights. And he learned everything from this knight. And he actually was a better knight fighting-wise than this knight. And so they need money. And so he pretends to be a knight. And they say, you're not a knight. He says, well, I can pretend to be a knight. Okay, well, you need a name. comes up with a name. Sir von Lichtenstein. Ulrich von Lichtenstein. He says, okay, you've got a name. You need some patents that show your nobility. He, fe he finds a guy named Geoffrey Chaucer, this movie. He finds Geoffrey Chaucer. Geoffrey Chaucer writes up some nice patents for him. And then Geoffrey <coughs> Chaucer becomes his herald. And, and before every fight, Jeffrey Chaucer gets up and he goes, oh, and he tells some story how he saved someone and did these great mighty deeds. And he said, I give you von Lichtenstein, and the whole crowd's cheering, and he's, he's this herald. John was this herald for Jesus. And he attracted a significant following. People came to John, and he urged them to repent. But then he did what? He introduced them to someone who's even mightier than he, who did it all, who would do it all. Jesus Christ, the Lord. And he says, there's someone coming. You guys are all attracted to me. I'm telling you to get ready to confess your sins. You're repenting. I'm baptizing you. But let me tell you, there's something more. I'm preparing you for someone who's coming after me who's even mightier than I am. And then he introduced them to Jesus. So the next section here is that Jesus goes to the wilderness to begin his ministry. So John appeared in the wilderness to fulfill scripture in the spirit of Elijah to prepare people to hear Jesus and to announce Jesus to be his herald. And now Jesus goes to the wilderness where John is baptizing to start his ministry. Look at me in verse 9. 
In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. Note the perspective here is um, from Jesus. It's Jesus' point of view. He saw the heavens torn open. He heard a voice saying, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Jesus goes to the wilderness to begin his ministry. And then we know in other, other Gospels, John says to him, No, I'm not going to baptize you. You, I need to be baptized by you, not, not me baptizing you. He says, no, let it be. It, it, it's supposed to be this way. It, the, the Father has pur purposed this, that you would baptize me. It's right for me to do this. And so he does this. He's baptized. And we see a couple of interesting things here. Um, the heavens are torn apart. Anytime the heavens were torn apart in the Old Testament... The heavens were torn apart meant something big is about to happen. I mean, I think we could, we could say that if we saw the sky being ripped apart, we would say something's going on here. And this was where God would, would usually say something or present something or there'd be a sign from the Lord. So the heavens are ripped apart. And then we do see this sign. The voice of God speaks and the, the Holy Spirit descends and Mark says, like a dove. He doesn't necessarily say a dove came down. He says he des the Spirit descended like a dove. And who saw this, according to Mark? Jesus. Jesus sees the Spirit descending like a dove. Now, there are other gospel accounts. John the Baptist says, and I saw the Holy Spirit descending like a dove as well. So others saw this too. John, at least, saw this as well. And we have three gospels that say this is my son. You are my, you are my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased. Matthew says, "This is my son." And so, a very simple uh, solution to this, it seems like an apparent contradiction, one of those things that seems like both of these things can't be true. Well, they both can be true. God could have said to Jesus, "You are my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased," and then said to those around him also. This is my son. Just like you say, you are my son. And then I say, this is my son. Right? And my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And so we have both of those things occurring here. But Mark gives us the perspective from Jesus. We, he sees the dove, he sees the Holy Spirit descend like a dove. He sees the sky ripped open and he hears the Father say, you are my beloved son. I am well pleased. <laughs> the descent of the Spirit was like an anointing. Remember the, the kings were anointed? Who was the man that anointed Saul? Samuel. Samuel anointed Saul. Then Samuel anointed David. And when he did that, he poured oil on his head and, he just, and it came down upon him as an anointing, a, a pouring over him. Um, I'll just give you three verses in Isaiah. You can maybe jot them, check and look at them later. Isaiah 11.2 talks about the Spirit of the Lord resting upon him. Isaiah 42.1 says, I have put my Spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. These are messianic prophecies out of Isaiah. Isaiah 61.1, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. And this is all about Jesus. The Holy Spirit came down and anointed him. R.T. France writes, Baptism and the descent or anointing of Jesus by the Holy Spirit marked him as the Messiah, the Christ. It affirmed this is the Messiah. So if the sky ripping apart, God the Father saying, This is my Son in whom I'm well pleased, was not enough. The, the Holy Spirit also descends upon him and anoints him. 
pointing out this is the Son of God. So, this is also a quote from Psalm 2 7. I will tell the decree, the Lord said to me, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Now, if you want to go back in the sermons on John, I, I went over this quite a bit. But suffice it to say that there was never a time that Jesus did not exist. And there was never a time that Jesus was not the Son of God. He has always existed from the beginning of time and even before time began as the Son of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Nicene Creed talks about this. It says, Jesus, the Son of God, begotten of the Father, is begotten from the essence of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not created. In other words, they were saying, we are not exactly sure what that means, but it's not created. It's not that the Father all of a sudden said, wham, now there's the Son. Or that Jesus was some being, and now all of a sudden he becomes the Son of God. Now he's always existed as the Son of God. John 1 is very clear about this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. Without him was nothing made that was made. Sometime in 19, 1972, I did not exist. I was born July 17. Well, it's next week. Oh, 1973. So there was a time in 1972 that I did not exist. Same with you. There was a time that you did not exist. But like me, you had some definite beginning. This is true of every human being that existed, except for one, Jesus. There was no time that Jesus did not exist. He always existed, and when he became a man, he took on humanity, but he had existed as the Son of God forever. So Jesus began his ministry in the wilderness, and the point here of this passage is that the God the Father is affirming Jesus is the Son, the Holy Spirit is affirming Jesus is the Son and anointing him as the Messiah, the Christ. And John the Baptist is confirming Jesus as the Messiah and declaring to everyone who is prepared for Jesus that he is the Son of God. Jesus, the Son of God, began his ministry in the wilderness. The last section is verse 12 and 13. The Spirit immediately drove him into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. This verb is forceful. It's kind of odd. The Spirit drove him into the wilderness. I'm sure Jesus, who never sinned, was compliant. And if the Spirit directed him, he would go. But it says that it drove him. It took him into the wilderness. We have an example here of, I think, the Spirit guiding and directing. And there are times, I think, that the Spirit guides and directs Christians as well. We see examples of that in Acts where he told Paul to go somewhere or did this or told Philip to go here and there. And he, I think he still, he still works in, in ways of, of guiding us. But here he drove Jesus into the wilderness. So Jesus went to the wilderness to start his ministry with John the Baptist. And now he goes to the wilderness further, maybe deeper in the wilderness to be tempted. 40. Have you ever heard the number 40 in the Bible before? Think of some of the places. Good. Moses, do you know how long he was on Mount Sinai when he received the commandments the first time? 40 days and nights. Elijah took a 40-day journey with supernatural provision. God gave him cakes and water that was enough to sustain him for 40 days. 40 years of wandering that the Israelites did. 40 years after the exile. All these involved the wilderness or mountains getting out. And 40 years. The wilderness is wild. He was with wild animals. And the angels were ministering to him. You know, like I said, in Colorado, we have a lot of wilderness around here. You don't have to drive very far to get into BLM or get into the forest. 
And pretty soon you can be in a place where there are no people and there's no trace of a person. And if you stay there long enough, you'll see some wild animals. Maybe innocent deer, or cute little chipmunks, to bobcats, lion, mountain lions, and bears. When looking at scripture, we sometimes we can tend to view, as I said at the beginning, this wilderness as a negative place. Jesus, John the Baptist was in the wilderness. People went to the wilderness. Jesus was to go to the wilderness. But the reality is, God presents the wilderness very differently here in Mark 1. <clears throat> he called people to the wilderness to hear his message. People left the cities to go out and hear John. They left their comfort to go to the wilderness. They left the busyness and bustle to get into the wild. And it was there that God sent his prophet. It was there that they heard from God. Jesus went to the wilderness. He was baptized in the wilderness. He was tempted by Satan in the wilderness. Do you find yourself in the wilderness today? Some of you will be there in a few hours with us. But what about physically or spiritually or emotionally? A place of uncertainty, danger, limited resources. The good news is <clears throat> the God who leads us into these places also meets us in the wilderness. He can provide for our physical and emotional and spiritual needs. What is our role? Our role? Same thing that John called the people to do in the wilderness. To repent. To turn to him. To trust in Jesus. Maybe there's something you're going through right now that makes you feel like you're wandering, alone, without direction, hope, or certainty. Or maybe you're needing a decision about the future, like your child's schooling, or your career. Or maybe you're at a point where you're dating, or you're thinking about the future, a spouse. And you feel like you're in the wilderness. The good news is you're in good company. The Israelites were in the wilderness for 40 years, and, and God met them there. In fact, it was this time of preparation. They left Israel, I mean, they left Egypt, and he prepared them in the wilderness. That's where they got the Ten Commandments, instruction. That's where they learned how to worship. That's where they got physical needs met with manna and quail, water bursting forth from a rock. You may feel like you're in a wilderness now, alone, without hope. God meets you in the wilderness. He speaks truth through his prophets and scribes, namely the Bible. When you're going through a, a tough period, don't neglect God's word. You know what Jesus did when he was with Satan in the wilderness? What did he do to combat Satan? Quoted scripture. Quoted scripture. What book of the Bible did he quote out of? Deuteronomy. If your survival in the wilderness depended upon your scripture memory of Deuteronomy, how would you do? He knew scripture so well, but he knew Deuteronomy, and he and those were the verses that he, he spoke back to Satan. We have got to get in God's word when we're in the wilderness. We've got to listen to him, listen to the Holy Spirit, who can give us direction. And trust that God will provide for you. He'll give you what you need. It may be locusts and water, but take heart. It's also honey. There was honey with the locusts. And we think of locusts as something kind of weird. That was actually something that he prescribed, God prescribed in Leviticus. That locusts were a good food for them to eat. It was okay. And, and the, that is still in the Middle East, in some places, they still they'll eat locusts. And it's not like doing some gross, you know, thing to get on TV. It, it's what they would eat. It's an animal that was permissible, permissive, permitted um, to eat. But God leads us into the wilderness. He gives us protection, instruction, direction, and provision. So that when we leave the wilderness, we're ready to minister to others. There are people that never venture outside of their home. This day and age, I think you could do that. You could stay at home, get everything delivered to you, never leave your house. We like comfort. I like comfort. 
But there are times God calls us, even drives us, into the wilderness where it's not so safe, where things aren't so clear, where we are uncomfortable. And in those times, we need to remember that God is with us. He meets us there. He gives us instruction, direction, protection, and provision. And he calls us out of our comfort to see if we'll trust him, to see if we'll repent from our sin, and to see if we'll follow where he leads us. If you're in the wilderness, remember God is with you. And if you're out of the wilderness, just remember this. Tuck this away. That there may be a time coming where you're not so secure. You're not so comfortable. You're pushed out of your comfort zone. And in that time, that's the time that we listen to God. That's the time that we look to Him. That's the time that we trust Him. Next week, we're going to be reading Mark 1, 14 through 28. And I want to encourage you to be studying this and reading this on your own while I prepare so that when we come together, we've all done some work and we're, we're coming together in God's Word. And again, the point of this is so that we see that Jesus is God's Son. That he came and lived a perfect life, died on the cross for our sins. On the third day, he rose and ascended into heaven. And if you're not convinced about that, I encourage you to continue reading the Gospel of Mark. Continue coming to the sermon series. Dig in. Next week, we'll see Mark 1, 14 through 28, as Jesus ends his time of testing and steps in to his ministry out of the wilderness and in to ministry.